years ago at a steak restaurant here in Dallas, Texas, I ran into Troy Aikman. Now, Troy Aikman's all-world quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys, and I don't know where you're watching that. Maybe that makes you hate me and want to turn this thing off. I didn't say I liked him. I just said I ran into him at a steakhouse. And, and here's what's funny uh, about my relationship with Troy. Um, one, I know a lot about him. I, I know he started out at the University of Oklahoma and then got injured. Couldn't win his starting job back, so he transferred out to UCLA. I know he was a first-round pick by the Dallas Cowboys. I know his nickname was the Golden Boy, and he set all sorts of NCAA records. I know that his first year with the Cowboys, he was 1-15, and and it looked like it was a bad pick. And then he went on as they put pieces around him to crank out the Super Bowls for the city of Dallas and for the Dallas Cowboys. Now, here's what's interesting. I know a lot about Troy Aikman, right? But I don't know him. If you were to see him and you were to walk up to him and say, hey, Matt Chandler said he would have no clue who you were talking about because the fact that I knew things about him does not equate that I actually know him. And I'll tell you why that's important going into this, this session in particular. When it comes to purity and what it means to be godly in relationships, to honor the other and to walk in such a way that shows that Christ is supreme, what I've found is the majority of young men and women know what's right and good, and yet the practice of that knowledge seems to be what's lacking. And so in this session, we're gonna look at not just the knowledge, but really how to practice and walk in that knowledge. And, and again, once again, I wanna keep reminding you of this, how you might walk for your own joy and the glory of God. It's your joy that's at stake here. And so in this session, we're gonna hear about how we might be happy in the Lord as we pursue purity. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. Uh, Song of Solomon is where we'll be. Uh, we're going to pick it up in verse 7 of chapter 1, and we'll make some pretty good headway uh, on into, um, pretty deep into chapter 2 in our time together here. So uh, what, what we've covered so far now is, is you have um, a, a woman who has looked at King Solomon. So if we just flatten that and talk about uh, our relationships, we have been attracted to someone. Uh, that attraction started uh, as a physical attraction. Uh, we then, uh, in a more uh, safe, kind of distant circle, kind of hanging out with one another, began to test uh, their character by looking at the long shadow of their reputation, watching how they live life. Not going to be quick to throw our heart out there, going to be patient, going to watch. And, and then what we've seen up to this point uh, is not a real serious entry into uh, what we might call dating or uh, what might historically be considered courtship. It's simply at this point a type of testing of the water uh, to see if she should jump in. And then we see in verse 7 some things begin to change. And so let's look at verse 7. Uh, here's what she says. Tell me, you whom my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companion? So now this is no longer just physical attraction. So physical attraction along with uh, his name being poured out like oil has now moved into, hey, what are you doing Friday? Where are you going to be? Now this is a jump in confidence. And if you are single, this is a risky question. Uh, right? I mean, you're, there's starting to be some risk now. This is not just hanging out in a group going, you know what? He handles suffering well. It, it's, hey, where are you going to be Friday? Because I'm going to show up there. So there's some inherent risk now involved. And, and so she throws it out there. Where are you going to be? And so now we've moved past uh, attraction and kind of our yellow light, red light game. Uh, and now we've seen we're moving into a more serious level of the relationship. And so let's call this um, first part, this first section, let's just call this and look at it as dating. Now, um, dating in our day and age is, let me just be straight, is goofy. Uh, I mean, it's absurdly goofy. It's literally like if you're a used car salesman, I apologize, but like selling a used car. It's like hide anything that might not lead to the sell and, or sale and just put out there what might make this thing sale. And, and the sell is almost always sex. And, and so dating's a lot about hiding who you really are, hiding your imperfections, and, and, and then really the 
three or I guess four categories um, for dating. Uh, and it's funny because the first two are nearly obsolete now. Um, the first way of dating is just what's called traditional dating. This is um, where there is an expectation and hope that you will either stumble across someone or be introduced to someone of the opposite sex. You two will begin to hang out. You will begin to know one another, and then you will begin to spend time in social settings with one another. And so that's traditional dating. That's how it's been viewed and looked upon um, for an extended period of time in human history. So this is just traditional dating. Since the man and woman were given, young man, young woman were given right to find their own spouses because for a long time in human history, that was arranged by mom and dad. And even in many parts of the world right now, and even in some cultures in the metroplex, marriages are still arranged. And funny enough, they tend to do far better than those who are left to 19-year-olds to find even thinking about trying to train up Audrey and Nora, like this is normative for us white folk. This is what we do. Uh, We'll see how that goes. And so uh, now um, you've got traditional dating, but traditional dating, because people are getting married so much older, is sharply in decline because now people aren't getting married till well after college. And so finding that place that you can trip over another person that's not overly complicated. So uh, it's not your boss or your coworker or someone who works for you or you because those tend to be taboo. There are plenty of people that try them, uh, not too many people who succeed in the try. And, and so that's given way to a bunch of different other methodologies around dating. The one uh, that, that kind of exploded out of the ground in the early 2000s and also is nearly obsolete now is speed dating. Uh, and so a third party would host a gathering and that gathering was meant to give you as much interaction with different people as possible in the hope that something would spark and that that would lead to connecting all the more after the speed dating uh, evening occurred that you would leave with, I believe, what's called digits. Uh, and so from there, that, that has almost completely vanished and has been replaced with the $1 billion industry of online dating. So 11% of the United States population uses online dating. Of those 11%, 66% of them have actually gone on what would be a traditional date birthed out of their online connection. So uh, you did the compatibility deal on eHarmony. You got some hits. You started conversing. Uh, and then that led to uh, a date. And, and so that, that is, by and large, the most popular way for young singles to find one another right now. Now, um, the fourth and easily the most disturbing, and there's been tons written on this, is not online dating, but it, do, it is driven by technology, and, and it's what has been called or marked or named the hookup culture. Uh, and so this is where um, young men and women, or just single men and women, or God help us, e- even some people who are already in relationships, create an online identity and use that online identity to connect with either total strangers or people they barely know for the purpose of either sexual intercourse or at least to um, make out and feel loved. And the, stat, the stats on this are staggering. Um, one study that I read, and, and again, you know the way I feel about statistics if you go to the Village Church, but 77.7% of college females have admitted to at least hooking up in some sense. 77.7% of young women in college, according to the survey, oftentimes connect with young men they either don't know at all or barely know for the sole purpose of either just making out or having sex. Of that number, the males trump that, like you would guess they would, to the tune of 84.2% of males participate in this culture of hooking up. So if sex is what God says it is, there are few things as damaging to the human soul as the hookup culture. It is yet another symptom of a com- confused and broken society that has elevated the role of physicality and sex beyond its biblical norms and has 
poisoned itself and its flourishing contentment and joy, sacrificing that on the altar of momentary pleasure that leaves the uh, brokenness of regret in its wake. And so what I want to do is talk to you quickly uh, about dating and things that we'll see here in the song that should be present in a dating relationship and should be growing. And, and so if you've moved, if they passed kind of the previous test of attraction and now you're moving into, you guys are hanging out more often, you're spending more time, you've seen the character, you've seen these things. There might be some yellow lights, but you wanna proceed and so you begin to date. Here are some things simply to be mindful for uh, or of. Uh, look at verse eight. Here's his response to her question. If you do not know, O oh, most beautiful among women, follow in the tracks of the flock and pasture your young, your young goats beside the shepherd's tent. Now, um, w- what we see happening is she asks this question. It's a gutsy question. I love this woman. Uh, I mean, she just goes, hey, where are you going to be Friday? Because I'm showing up. Now, what he just did is, is he just showed reciprocity. He, he's in. All right, so he's excited that she's excited, and so he doesn't say, well, give me your number and I'll call you, or I'll text you to not call me. He then goes, well, you know what? On Friday, what I was really gonna do is this, and I'm, you know, it's not really a good time. I'll get back with you. you know, uh, instant message me or text me. You know, that's not what happens. He's flirty. He's playful. Well, if you do not know, O oh, most beautiful among women, follow the tracks. Find me, boo. Okay, boo's not in the text, I added that, but, but it is playful. So he's playful. So for those of you who are addicted to romantic comedies, that time early on where he's charming and funny and flirty, that's what's happening here. There's reciprocity. There is no dating relationship where there is not reciprocity. You being attracted. You um, navigating through kind of the yellow lights of character and and what's going on in the inside still does not lead to a dating relationship if the other person doesn't want one. You are not dating. You have not moved the relationship out of the friend zone if the other person doesn't want to leave the zone. Now, if you're thinking this is a no-brainer, Let me tell you, it's not a no-brainer to many people. It is never, ever, 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 ever okay to stalk, to pester, and to try to out-pressure the opposite sex in order to get them where you want them to be. It's ungodly. It's not right. There's reciprocity or your friends. There's reciprocity or your friends. No amount of manipulation or it is going to be right and good in the long run. We don't move out of friendship if there's not reciprocity. Uh, in fact, men, the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 2, that we should treat all women as though, or young women as though they are sisters. So I don't know if you have sisters. I, I have um, two. Uh, one of them is actually here tonight. Um, she was older than me, but I'll, I'll tell you about the younger one because it was hard for me to intimidate being lanky like I am, um, people two, three years older than me. But like my little sister didn't have a date until I graduated and left. And then, I mean, those brothers came out of the woodworks after I bailed, all right? Um, but well, while I, I was there, I mean, I had several friends, um, a guy named Brent, a guy named Jeff, several friends like, hey man, would you mind if I dated your sister? To which I responded, I very much mind. I very much mind, very, very much, much mind if you would, I would like you to not be anywhere near my sister. And, and I mean, that, that's, that's how the Lord would tell us to view young women. We want to protect, we want to encourage, we want to love. It's never okay to make a woman feel unsafe. It's never okay to make a woman feel um, pressured or like she's got to avoid you or like she can't. If she's saying, this ain't happening, that it's not happening. And, and ladies, in the same way, in, in the same way, if this isn't where he wants it to go, then, then you throwing down ultimatums 
or you trying to seduce is a practice of folly that'll do nothing but maybe win your win some affection for a limited period of time until he regrets that and moves on. Don't, don't do it. There must be reciprocity to move out of the friend zone. Now, um, from there, uh, look at verse 9 and 10. It's a strange verse, but I think it's, it's, it's a great one. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments. Your necks, your neck, not necks, plural, your neck with strings of jewels. Now, it seems like an odd compliment to compare your girl to a horse. Done it? Like there'll be several times throughout the song that I'm going to say, don't use this line for line. And, and so this is one of those. But what we see happening in this relationship that is maturing is not only is there reciprocity, but it's a life-giving relationship. And here's how I know this to be true. The Pharaoh's horses were always white horses. He, he just, he had white Arabian horses. That's what the Pharaoh, that what drove Pharaoh's um, chariots when he was on one by himself. That's what he rode. The known horse of the Pharaoh was a white Arabian. Now let me tell you why that's significant. Um, my um, daughter, my oldest daughter, uh, rides horses. She does barrel racing and all that. She has a um, brown quarter horse that she named Gypsy, despite the evil nature of gypsies. And, uh, and if you're watching this and you're a gypsy, I don't know. If, I'm just going off this, so I'm sorry. Um, but uh, in the end, her horse is a brown horse, um, and she, there's a white Arabian out where we board uh, whose name is Toy. Uh, and Toy is a spectacular horse. And here's, here's what I can tell you about a white Arabian. Um, when we drive out to the barn or we're driving past the pasture, I can't always see Gypsy because there's 10, 11 other horses out there. And Gypsy kind of blends in to the background. And I mean, that brown color of Gypsy is the same color of the grass 90% of the year. Uh, it's like you, you can't see um, her for the bales of hay and for the butt. You can always see Toy. You can all, Toy stands in stark contrast to the rest of the surroundings. He doesn't blend in. White, powerful, beautiful, easy to spot. And so what he's just saying to our woman is, I see you. When, when I look at you, stand out to me. You're the one that my eyes go, you're not hard to find for me. Like when I see the crowd, I see you. you you're, so this is a life-giving relationship. So there, there's not a lot of um, playing going around in a negative sense. Well, tell me how you feel. Baby, you're like Pharaoh's horses. You stand out to me. I'm drawn to you. I think you are spectacular. I think you are powerful. This is life-giving. Listen to me. If attraction has caught character, has moved into reciprocity, and you find yourself dating someone that's making you miserable, that's exhausting, that is sending mixed signals, that brings tears and confusion to your heart, listen to me, get out. Break up, text them right now if they're sitting next to you. Just, we're over. You knew it when it came out of Matt's mouth. You're, we're, we're done. And whatever emoticon that you want to attach to that. Right, so it's life-giving. If the relationship is exhausting, life-sucking, lacks clarity, or someone is playing games, I would hit eject. Look at me, because it doesn't get better, it gets worse. Familiarity will not breed best behavior. The next thing, look at verse 11. We, this is outside approval now, we will make for you ornaments of gold studded with silver. So not only is it life-giving and there's reciprocity, but in that relationship as it grows, what we want is godly approval. Uh, we want men and women around us excited for this relationship. We don't want them pulling us aside going, you sure, bro? Hey, are you sure about him, sweet sister? Are, you, you, have you, are we seeing different things here? But in this text, what you have happening is godly uh, approval from outsiders. 
the Bible would tell us when it comes to um, what is wise and what is foolish in Proverbs 12, 15, it says this, the way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. So um, I know of multiple situations here at the church that I pastor where a young woman was attracted to a young man, began to pursue him, all sorts of yellow lights, but she was lonely. Some of her friends started to get married. You know, she was she gonna live by herself. What was she gonna do? She was tired of that. Um, and, and so pressed into a relationship where everyone, around her, her home group, um, godly older women, women in her life started going, hey, this isn't a good thing. Hey, I just, man, be careful with this. Here are things we're noticing here or what, and and saw, I mean, multiple stories like this where the woman just began to withdraw then, and she began to try to find women who did not know her as well and women who do not know this man as well to applaud the relationship severed her relationship with those who had encouraged her, walked alongside of her and spoken life to her, not afraid to confront her over her sin, not afraid to, uh, to um, rejoice in her victories. And yet in her loneliness, she went on to choose a greater loneliness of giving herself to a man who had no intention in the long run of loving and serving her like Christ loved the church. Does godly outsiders approve? Does your crew approve? Those who you listen to, those who you go to to ask for advice, do they see what's going on and do they uh, approve of it? If not, listen, that's a giant red flag. If godly people are going, this is a problem, this is not good. So, and here's why it's hard, because all the movies say that the people who are in defiance of legitimate love are are always wrong because it always ends out happy at the end, right? Except movies in life aren't the same. Except movies in life aren't the same. And there's a reason that we're drawn to that fantasy, because it's few of our realities. And then from there... Look at verses 12, um, 12 through 14. These, these verses are a little bit sticky, but I, I want to try to explain them. While the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. My beloved is to me a sachet of mirth, or sachet of mirth that lies between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyard, vineyards of Engedi. Um, so this sounds um, e- extremely explicit. Um, what's actually going on in this text is she's laying on her bed. She is thinking about Solomon, and, and she is excited that they are together. So let me frame this one up like this. In a dating relationship that's moving forward and doesn't need to end, both are showing initiative. Where there is no initiative, the relationship is on its way to death, if not walking dead. So what do I mean by initiative? So uh, this is, I've got a, this is a story much more to my shame um, and, and one that over the years I've had to really lay before the Lord and, and seek forgiveness. Um, when I was in college, I was very good friends um, with a young woman. That's all we were. We were just friends. I loved hanging out with her. She was godly. I thought she was beautiful. I just wasn't attracted in this way. Um, and so I just simply didn't pursue her that way, but loved hanging out with her. Um, and so one day she gave me an ultimatum. She's like, look, I like you. It's apparent I like you in a way that you don't like me. So we just can't be friends. And, and so in my foolishness, and again, this is great to my shame. Um, I, I just said, well, let's date a little bit. And so we just started to date and I immediately picked up on the reality that she was way more into me than I was into you and it all, or into her. And it, it came to a head when I went out of town for about three days uh, and, and I flew out and went out with some friends just in another state. And man, I just hardly thought of her when I did call. I was calling because I knew I was supposed to. Uh, and that was not how she was wired, not how she was thinking. I got a little letter at the hotel I was staying in. When I got home on my, on my front porch, there was this little, um, a little package of stuff that had my favorite kind of candies and, and all that kind of thing. And I remember thinking, I am a horrible human being. And so here I'm in this situation where um, I'm not showing any initiative. She's showing all the initiative, and it kind of came to this reality where either one day I was gonna wake up and realize this is the one for me, and we're gonna be married, or I was gonna wake up one day and go, this is absolutely not, and and I just knew that that would destroy her. And um, so 
I've got to shorten this story so we can go home. But um, in, in the end, ended up breaking up. It was awful. Um, really, really wounded her heart in some deep ways. Um, and, and even years later, uh, there was kind of residual effects from how I so poorly handled that. And, and, and that's why, again, out of my failure and out of a deep sense, even to this day, of shame uh, as a father of daughters and uh, as the husband uh, of uh, my wife, I think back on that and just with so much regret. And, and so if you're in a dating relationship and the other person is showing no initiative, then I'm telling you that, that relationship's already broken and you're on the clock you're, it's either dead already or on its way. If the other person is showing no initiative, you're driving everything and the other person drives nothing. They, they never go, hey, are we hanging out tonight? They never go, hey, let's go do that. They never, it's just always you driving it. Then I'm just saying that's, that's something to pay attention to. From there, um, look at what happens next. Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful. Our couch is green and the beams of our house are cedar. Our rafters are pine. So, so what we see now, let me, let me address this text like this. Let's talk about the foolishness of movie night when you're dating. All right, so one of the things that has happened on repeat here, in fact, I, I've had this conversation so often that I can articulate it well that a young man, young woman were dating. What do you want to do tonight? I don't know. Let's go grab something to eat. And so you go grab something to eat. Well, what do you want to do? Well, why don't we just go to your place and watch a movie? Now, nothing ever good and godly happens between non-married dating couples when they lay on a couch post 10 o'clock to watch a movie. It has never in the history of mankind led to discussions about cinematography <laughs> or the acting skills of said actor or actress. It has started with snuggling. It turned into mouth to head, mouth to mouth, hand to body, and then it progresses until one of them gets a cooler head or it goes all the way into what has been reserved for those who are under covenant love. And Solomon and our bride, they don't trust each other. Not in a bad, negative way. They don't trust each other's impulses for one another. And so what, what's happened in this text is there is safety and purity in this relationship concerning the physical relationship because look at where they're hanging out. Um, behold, you are beautiful, truly delightful. All right, so he's in. She is in. The beautiful, delightful are not words just to be thrown around. And where is their couch? Where well, their couch is green. They're outside. They're in the park. They're in public. The beams of our house are cedar. The rafters are pine. They're in a park. They're outside. They're not tempting one another's strengths. As you date, there will be a growing desire for physical intimacy. Look at me. Because God put in you a desire for physical intimacy intimacy. That desire is not bad. It simply must be held in check. Remember, he is the creator of it. He is the designer of it, and he is the giver of it. Look at it. It is not God's desire to keep from you any pleasure, but rather to lead you into the fullest pleasure possible. So with that said, we must be careful not to put ourselves in harm's Way. Don't do it. 10 o'clock, you two alone in an apartment, cuddled up on a couch, watching some movie is not going to lead to righteousness. It's not safe for her. It's not safe for you. Don't play it that way. The dating relationship should be safe and there should be a fight for purity. Goes on. One and two of the next chapter. 
I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys, as a lily among the brambles, so is my love among the young women. Okay, so another thing that has to take place in a dating relationship, or I would tell you to get out of that dating relationship, is clarity. She's not wondering what's going on. All right, they're out in public, going out on dates. He's saying, you're beautiful, you're delightful. There's no question that I am uh, above the other ladies, that I am yours, you are mine. There's something going on here. You have a relationship with me that is wholly unlike your relationship with others. There is clarity. If you're dating a young man or young woman who refuses to provide for you clarity, it is not a bad thing to demand that clarity before you give any more of your heart over. It is a foolish, foolish thing to surrender deep parts of your heart to someone who has not provided the clarity that they will not only hear that but take care of those areas of your heart. If dating's gonna move forward, if this is gonna get more serious, there must be clarity. Um, look at verse three. As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. With great delight, I sat in his shadow and his fruit was sweet to my taste. Not only is their relationship safe and pure, not only is there clarity, but she has a growing sense of ease and safety around him. That she's comfortable in his presence. She's not nervous. She's not frightened. The way he handles her, the way he walks with her, the way they talk, the way they spend time, she has seen in him a desire to protect her physically, to protect her heart, to protect her mind, granted clarity, and has also made her feel at ease. She loves to sit in his shadow, loves to eat of his fruit, this dialogue between the two. She feels safe and sound. Look at verse four. He brought me to his banqueting house and his banner over me with love. So uh, again, this relationship not only has clarity and all these things, but it's also open and honest. There, there are no secrets to the public sphere about what's going on here, all right? So he, he's not a man, and this isn't a relationship in which when they're together alone, he is sweet and loving and kind, and then when they're in public, he kind of ignores and doesn't acknowledge and, and is kind of mean and distant. That's not what's happened here. All right, his banner over me is love. He's not saying, hey, this is my buddy, the Shumalite woman. He's saying, this is my girl. He has changed his Facebook status. <laughs> He's letting the world know, I'm taken. This relationship with this woman is moving forward. And again, let me plead with you that if you are in a relationship where the other person refuses to acknowledge openly that their pursuit of you, delight in you, enjoyment of you goes beyond how they feel about the nine other women or men that you see them with, then you are not dating. Get out. You are caught in a game in which your heart is what you have bet. And the heart can heal, but it always takes a while. Always takes a while. And then let's look at five and six. Once again, this is just, I, I love that the Bible just never pulls any punches, but is always honest with us. Look at verses five and six. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am sick with love. His left hand under my head and his right hand embraces me. She, for all his kindness, clarity, and pursuit, has a growing desire for sexual touch. So um, raisins and apples in, in this period of time are um, really, e even there are times in Israel's history where um, they're, they're coming and, and they want to have a lot of babies. And so David would give uh, his men, uh, when they got back from war, um, raisin cakes and apples. It was like an aphrodisiac. It was, it was meant to uh, help you get pregnant. He was giving it to the men and going, go home, have babies. And so she's saying, some raisins. Some raisins. <laughs> A girl needs some apples right now. Right? So she's got this growing desire. It is not a bad 
or wrong thing to have a growing desire for sexual touch. It's not bad. It's God designed. We've come, come back to that a billion times before we land the plane on this study. It's not bad. It's good. It's not a perverse desire. It is a correct desire. Like I meet young men who sometimes go, I just want God to take this away from me. And I always just go, you really don't. <laughs> what you want him to do is empower your discipline and strength to be obedient. I don't want it taken away from me. It's good, it's right, it's God given. And yet, look at the next line, it's a word of caution. I adjure you, I plead with you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Um, I think Tommy Nelson, who's the first one I ever heard teach through this book, uh, I'm going to quote him here because I thought what he had to say here was just so profound. He, he compares um, physical desire, the desire for sexual touch, to uh, a fire and that you've got to be really careful with fire. Um, and here's what he says uh, about being obedient to God's command to keep this within the confines of marriage. He says, keeping a fire going requires two things, boundaries and appropriate fuel. In marriage, which is the boundary, that fuel is growing respect, tenderness, admiration, mutual desires, and dreams. Um, Christ-like relationship with others, extended family, friends, children, business associates, community, relationships, memories, and traditions established over time, romance, and the ongoing expression of affection, and so forth. So what he's saying is that the fuel of sexual zeal within the confines of marriage, within the boundaries of marriage, are um, growing affection, learning more about, deepening in knowledge, watching your spouse interact in ways that are oddly arousing to you. Watching your man be disciplined. Watching your man love your kids. Watching your wife serve you in a specific way. Watching you, these things that make you go, I am so physically aroused by such a weird thing that you just did. And he says, that's fuel in marriage. Service godliness, how we interact with family members and business associates, and then we have this respect for our spouse that goes beyond just mere physical, I like your shape, I like your form, that keeps us burning with lustful intent for our spouse long after the new wears off. You tracking with me? And yet Tommy would say it doesn't work that way outside of Christian marriage. Sex outside of marriage does not have either boundaries or appropriate fuel. Sex is demanding outside of marriage. Each person demands rights, insisting on gratification of self. Sex within marriage takes on an entirely new dimension, that of giving to the other, including those times when desire may not be strong. And so Tommy saying, you know why? The daughter's Adjure that they plead with us to not awaken love until it's time. Because if you enter into the physical too quickly, you squelch and wound the ability to grow in actual intimacy with another person. You crush the ability to actually grow in legitimate intimacy by sacrificing on the altar of a false intimacy where sexual contact feels intimate because in a way it is, but it actually lacks the bone and muscle to actually be intimate. And so you have the illusion of intimacy without the actuality of intimacy. So don't awaken love till it's time because you're going to stop talking. You're going to stop digging around in the depths of each other's souls. You're going to stop trying to figure out how to communicate better. You're going to stop trying to figure out what makes the other person tick and instead just enjoy one another physically. It will be enjoying and it will leave you hollow. And it will break the future depth of the relationship. Now, can it be repaired by the gospel? Sure. But resetting a bone is never pleasant. 
And the collateral damage done on the human soul for sexual sin is significant. It is a sin, as the Bible says, against one's own body. And so he says, we plead with you, do not awaken love until it's time. Now, if the dating relationship is moving along and we see these things happening or growing, nobody's going to nail these lists 100%. You know that, right? You're not going, well, you're out. Easy, slow down on the trigger pull there, all right? Uh, I, I, I think that what you want to see is trajectory in all of these things. No one's nailing these things. I'm not nailing these things now. But is there a trajectory? Is there the man or woman that's heading in these directions and is grieved for their sinfulness? Not that they regret it, but that they're grieved that they've sinned against God and you. And I think where there's repentance and confession and a seriousness about walking in the ways of the Lord and, and, and you want to continue to work, then, then continue to work. But, but dating then um, moves, you know, there's different stages of dating. And, and so if we're at this place now where you've got all of these things happening, I, I, I would like um, to propose for us that we move from just simply dating and into a more serious version of dating, which is courtship. Uh, and courtship is when you're not just dating to date anymore, but now you're dating to move towards marriage. We're going to see, are, are you and I going to be together for the rest of our lives? And so in this phase of, of dating, some things kind of change. Now, one of the things I want to start talking about right now, especially coming out of that session, is that there are those of you now have watched that session who right now are interacting with the opposite sex in a way that is not good and right before the Lord, not good and right for your soul. And others of you are married and you're thinking back on the things that you did before you were married. And maybe there's a sense of shame and guilt starting to settle in on the heart. Well, I want to speak directly into that as we close out this session. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that there is no sin with more power than the cross of Christ so that the sins of our past are fully covered and forgiven. The struggles of our present, if we are repentant and willing to fight, are covered fully and our mess ups and, and stumble and fallings of tomorrow are fully forgiven in the person and work of Jesus. And so as we leave this session and go on back to life, let us own our sin. Let us seek out forgiveness for those we have taken advantage of or harmed, but let us not lose heart that God is for us and not against us. Mm -hmm.